Looking at the artifacts left behind by the ancients, it is obvious that they had different values, customs, and beliefs from ours today. History books are filled with stories of war, invasion of territories, and patriarchal ways of being and thinking. Yet, it seems that ancient Egypt enjoyed long periods of peace and prosperity, and a profound connection with nature and spirit. Is there a way to understand the shift? So what we refer to as history that began some 6,000 years ago is really the advent of a, a different style of social organization that's typified by hierarchies of dominance, you know, warring deities, warring mythologies, and control systems. Vedic culture from ancient India speaks of a grand and measurable cycle of 26,000 years consisting of ascending light ages and descending dark ages. In the higher ages, you see this philosophy of living in tune with nature. People talk about speaking with the gods and a lot of interaction. Virtually every ancient culture has stories about the gods if you go back far enough. And you see a lot of uh, matriarchal cultures if, if you go back far enough. You know, the Dark Age times, you have this very brutal, uh, paternalistic type of uh, ruling. I think it's difficult for us to understand the ancient Egyptians because we've got the paradigm of the patriarchal structures on top of it, and we're looking through our own cultural lenses. Has world culture always been male-dominated and patriarchal? If not, what would a matriarchal system look like? Matriarchy is not the opposite of patriarchy, with women dominating and controlling men. It is based on balance between the masculine and feminine, and harmony with nature. This was exemplified in ancient Egypt, which was known in the old language as the land of Kent. Hakim Awian received teachings about the Kamishan people in the distant past. The ancient life system in Egypt here. The Kamishan tradition being passed down through the mother. Mother is the teacher. Not the father like patriarchy system, this is matriarchy. She is the goddess, she is everything in the house. Based on the countless artifacts that show the high status of the feminine, it seems that women had the same status as men, if not a higher status. In the museum, uh, you have uh, statues. Uh, you notice that the woman put the arm around the man's shoulder. And uh, that shows, are they equal? No. Woman was the upper head in the family. When she put her arm around the man's shoulder, she's saying, this is mine. You also see that uh, the sculpture in, in the old days put the feminine wig on a man's head when he promoted uh, more to a woman than a man. Men's wigs were layered in different lengths, like steps. Women's wigs were parted in the middle, smooth, and all one length. When a man wore a woman's wig, it was an indication that he had high status. And only men with wisdom who wear the women wig. So these are the scribes and the physicians and the rest of them. All you can do is go back into the old kingdom and what you find is, you know, is obviously a fair amount of equality. The goddesses are revered as reverently as the gods. And there's even the instance, for example, of, of, of Hathor, the, the exception in that she's the only deity that has a temple column all to herself. So the great mother, the great feminine principle, occupies a very important part in, in the whole Egyptian symbology, the whole Egyptian doctrine. There's no, there's absolutely no doubt about that. 
women could own property at as much rights as the men. They could divorce as easily as the men. Of all the known sophisticated civilizations that we have access to, probably women were better off in Egypt than they were anywhere else. Perhaps we are looking at ancient Egypt from a patriarchal viewpoint. We should let the symbolism in the artifacts tell their own story. The frescoes we see lining temple walls in Egypt and on stone slabs in museums around the world each tell their own story. We see the same images repeated again and again in Egyptian art. By learning to decode these symbols, we can look back in time, peeling back the layers of patriarchy that cloud our understanding of ancient history. Then we can begin to decipher the messages that the ancients left us. You have to accept that we're dealing with a period that occurred at least 5,000 years ago. And the little we know of it comes from archaic texts that were written in a very occult and esoteric manner. They weren't meant for you and me. The secrets of the ancient Egyptians were not for the commoners. They were meant for a very, very small group of elites who had to be initiated over many, many years to appreciate what this text said. They were for the high-level initiates, which were people who were trained, and they would go through different initiations, tests, that would help them be wise, that would help them confront their fears, that would balance them, balance them in the body, mind, and emotions. Initiates were students who were given rudimentary instruction on the mystery traditions of Mayan and Egyptian cosmic cycles. As they approached higher levels of consciousness, they came to respect different aspects of themselves that were represented in the feminine and the masculine. But they went further and called it sacred feminine and sacred masculine, which meant the purest form that was actually connected to the two hemispheres of the brain. Feminine consciousness corresponds to the right hemisphere of the brain and the left side of the body. In contrast, masculine consciousness corresponds to the left side of the brain and the right side of the body. Patriarchal consciousness focuses on history, linear time, dogma, rationality, waking reality, and science. Matriarchal consciousness focuses on eternity, cycles of time, ritual, magic, altered states, and art. If we examine the art, we can see the characters almost always have one foot slightly forward. In some instances, they take a big step forward. In each scene, the goddess has her left foot slightly leading, showing awareness of the feminine principles of timelessness and magic. The pharaoh, however, takes a large step with his right foot. This shows that he is grounded in the masculine. Similarly, we often see images with two left hands. It has been suggested that this is just a stylistic convention but we should not impose our ideas on Egyptian art. Left hands suggest giving, while right hands suggest taking. In our culture, we've practically erased the feminine in favor of the masculine, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Art, music isn't as important, and our society is completely unbalanced because of it. The ancients knew that you could not achieve high states of consciousness without these being in balance. And so they revered the pure qualities of either. And so when we say sacred feminine and sacred masculine, this was the highest form of respect so that the female would have both feminine and masculine balanced within her, and the male would have both feminine and masculine balanced within him. Balance between the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine runs deep in Egyptian symbolism. 
We see gods and goddesses carrying a crook, a flail, and a staff in various combinations. The crook represents the balance of the emotions. The flail symbolizes the balance of the mind. And the staff depicts the balance of the body. Once balance of the body, the mind, and the emotions was achieved, consciousness could develop. Notice the staff always has the head of a bird and a forked base. The staff never touches the ground. This indicates that we are spiritual beings having an earth experience. We are incarnated here, but our souls can go beyond the earthly plane. Egyptian temples were places where spiritual work was done. An arch with a winged disc is always found at the entrance to temples. The winged disc depicts a vulture and a snake. The snake been taken as a symbol of masculine and uh, the vulture is feminine. The feminine and the masculine had to be in balance. The lower self was to surrender to the higher self in order to enter the sacred space. This meant that the ego of the everyday world had to step aside, while the higher self connected with cosmic energy. A vulture can fly, a snake can't fly, but both have the same glands. System of life is based on glands. The glands were the most important features of the human being. One of the most misunderstood functions of the human body today is our glandular or endocrine system. Glands secrete hormones that trigger reproduction. Fertility and procreation had high value in Egyptian ideology. The ancients were very much in tune with how the energy systems in the body, or the chakras, as the East Indians would talk about them, were connected to the glands. Ancient teachings speak of seven energy centers in the body called chakras. Parallels occur between the concepts of chakras, or energy centers in the body, and our glands. It appears they are two ways of describing the same thing, through spirituality and through science. Ancient Egyptians had a holistic understanding of the significance of the glands and their central role in reproduction and in consciousness. If we can decode the symbols, we see that the sacredness of procreation is 